Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's weekly podcast on leadership with Scott Miller, the world's largest weekly leadership podcast where each week I'm privileged to serve as the host and interviewer and have a chance to shine Franklin Covey's spotlight onto some of the most amazing minds in the world, all focused on making you a better leader, whether they're best-selling authors, business titans, celebrities, athletes, researchers, or perhaps people who are not even household names that have maybe survived some kind of trauma or setback and have lived to share some great examples. We're focused on making you a better leader in your organization as an entrepreneur for your side hustle, perhaps informally as a leader in your family. We've had some amazing interviews, and today I'm delighted to shine our spotlight on John Baldoni. He is a 16 times author, world-renowned coach, consultant, keynote speaker. I know him from the prestigious group of which he is a member, and I'm kind of an interloper known as the MG100, the 100 coaches from Marshall Goldsmith. He and I have become friends, and now 16 books, and his third book on the topic of grace. John, welcome to On Leadership. Well, Scott, it's such a pleasure, and you are no interloper, my friend. You are a full-fledged member, and we uh, love having you as our member because you bring so much to the party. So that's, thank you for inviting me. That's oh. uh, gracious, but of course, that's the topic of what your expertise is, is your third book on the topic of grace is just out called Grace Under Pressure. You are a, you know, a well-established author, written, gosh, 16-plus books. John, let's, before we talk about grace and the topic of grace as it relates to leadership in the workplace, will you rewind a couple of years and decades and maybe reorient our listeners and viewers around the world to your own career trajectory and how you became one of the most in-demand coaches in the world? Well, thank you, Scott. It all began in high school. So let's begin there. No, <laughs> seriously. No, my initial Back career in 1920, was in John, let's talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we got to have fun. No, you know, let's go. Uh, seriously, my initial career was uh, in filmmaking. And then I migrated to uh, marketing communications where I became a speechwriter. And, you know, I always tell this guy, and, you know, so many people, we talk about the topic of leadership. As we know it now, our discussions of it are something of a fad. Not leadership, of course, has been with us time immemorial. But the way we talk about it within the nonprofit and corporate sector is something relatively in the last couple of uh, three decades or so. So I was asked as a senior level speechwriter writing for senior people to write about leadership. And I got to this point, Scott, where I thought, you know, I'd rather be saying those things. And so if you're a speechwriter, what's your hallmark? Anonymity. <laughs> but if you want to be on the stage, you got to do a career change. So I went back to school, got a master's, and began uh, writing under my own name. Um, then went through uh, coaching certification, hooked up with Marshall. Marshall Goldsmith was the one who said, John, you ought to be a coach. So that's how I got into that. And then once I published a couple of books, I started speaking about them. And that's it. My initial writing, though, was, you know, kind of nuts and bolts leadership, but uh, I've evolved over time. So thank you. So. John, your current release is Grace Under Pressure, a topic you are passionate about, written a lot about. It's a term that we, I at least, tend to think about perhaps from a spiritual or religious perspective at all, providing grace or on the receiving end of grace. For those who are religious people, you probably hear that, that term at church or perhaps your mosque or synagogue. Uh, for those leaders who may not resonate with the term grace in a professional leadership setting, build a bridge for them real quickly. Well, you are you hit the nail on the head. My first introduction to grace, of course, was through um, uh, the Jesuits who taught me. I was educated that way. But grace, I'm focusing on the secular power of grace. And what I define grace as the catalyst for the greater good. And I'm putting it through the prism of leadership. So my first book on the topic of grace was called Grace, A Leader's Guide to a Better Us. And so I talked about generosity, respect, compassion. And that what leaders do to put that into action is they act upon it and they energize the organization. So historically, grace comes, it's really wired to our DNA and it's its endemic in every faith and I think in our communities as well. So it's very much part of us, no matter how we label it. So. You know, John, I'm actually extremely comfortable with the term in a professional setting, but I have used this term prior to being introduced to your work years ago, Franklin Covey's multi-decade former CEO Bob Whitman, now the chairman of our board, was known as this kind of being the hallmark of his leadership style. 
providing people grace. Not, not you know, indulgences like you might get from the Pope, but just more <laughs> like, you know, pre-forgiveness and, and understanding your style might be different than mine and you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have bad judgment. You're going to say things that you're going to need to retract. Welcome to being a leader, especially a leader who's in the public arena, who's talking all day long. The odds are you're going to say things that you shouldn't and you're going to, need to offer an apology. Is that kind of how you view grace and leadership? Uh, it, that's the good first step, and and I'm sure Bar Bob is a remarkable leader, and I like the way you put that through. What Bob is doing first and foremost is treating people with respect, and also, uh, and when we make mistakes, as we all do, at least I know I do, you give them the benefit of the doubt, and that's where grace comes in. It's an open-hearted look at it, but looking at it more broadly from a uh, leadership standpoint, grace becomes the facilitator for what? community. And I think, Scott, you know, we've been through this uh, tough, tough time with the pandemic and people are, uh, as our friend Marshall Goldsmith says all the time, people are lonely and research backs that up. Uh, and so they're looking for connections. And Grace is a facilitator for connections. So that's my avenue for speaking about it. So, you know, John, the book is titled Grace Under Pressure, Leading Through Change and Crisis. But I'm guessing that grace is not the natural emotion that leaders are feeling when they're in the midst of change and crisis. They're focused on survival. They're focused on hitting their quarterly number. They're focused on what the inner report is going to say about their legacy and the stock price. I'm guessing grace is the last emotion that high, accountable leaders are thinking about. You spent your, most of your life in the corporate world. What would you say about those leaders who might think, yeah, I get it, but that is so naive. I've got, you know, two regions that are underproducing. Grace is not going to get them to the end of the quarter with their EBITDA contribution. What's, what's the bridge, again, you would build there for leaders who understand grace, but they have underproducing people who are not delivering on commitments and the company's success is at risk? Well, that, you hit the nail on the head, exactly. And that's the first book of Grace. Uh, got a lot of reviews, but it didn't really have the, quote, muscle to it. So Grace Under Pressure deals with how do we employ grace when the heat's on. So there's three things leaders do, just what you talked about. Take care of their people, take care of themselves, and prepare for the future. And by doing those three things, they'll, and they do it with the spirit of grace. So what is that spirit of grace? It's courage, it's commitment, it's resilience. It's teaching, it's engagement, it's building community. All of those things are measurable, but they all bring us together. So when someone is underperforming, the first question, you know this very well from all your research and writing and, and teaching, and, and, and you've been a successful executive, is why is that person? Is it me, is it the organization, or is that individual? Grace is that facilitator that says, I'm not gonna make any assumptions, let's do some research, let's figure this thing out first. So that would be my answer. So. John, I've read a lot about recently, maybe it's just serendipitous, about fear and how fear drives our decisions. Fear drives a lot of people's success. It drives their failure. You write in the book that there are several conditions that exist when uh, a leader expresses grace. They put others first, listen before speaking, look for problems to solve, encourage people to speak out. These are not, you know, these are not epiphanies, but they're foundational beliefs of leaders. And still hope in the face of adversity, act with courage, and drive out fear. I want to talk about that for just a moment. What do leaders do specifically to drive out fear? Is it a transparency issue? Is it allow people to make mistakes? Give us some context around specifically when a leader is driving out fear, what is she or he doing? Well, that's a great question. Um, and it gets back to this idea of community. If, if psychological safety, as uh, Amy Edmondson teaches us, it's making it pe feel that they belong. So when you feel belong that you belong, then you feel that you're part of this community. But first of all, leaders model this. And so I've had in my show, which you've been a guest on, Grace Under Pressure, uh, coincidental name, isn't it? Um, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of experts in this area, including folks on special forces. And they train, they train, they train for, um, in, in uh, stress situations so that when they are in a conflict zone or whatever, they know how to react. They still feel the fear. They know how to manage it. So the leader manages the fear. 
and so by setting that example, people feel, oh, okay, um, I can uh, approach this. And the leaders lead it by example. They show, they act with uh, their calm, their demeanor. Uh, they say in the military, when the heat is on, the commander's voice gets lower and slower. So, But it's all about creating, kind of making your team around you feel that they're part of something. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody gets a free pass. We all have our strengths. We all have our things to work on. But it's it's but accountability begins with the leader, and he or she shares that spirit with the team. John, I want you to think back to the two plus years we were in the pandemic, and clearly there were some leaders that were able to thrive while perhaps others imploded. So take out, for example, the industry they were in, the geography, the laws, whatever it was. What are the characteristics of leaders that thrive during this massive change? What did they have in common? And would you say there was probably some particular pre-work that they had done on their paradigm, on their skill set, on their maturity that allowed them to thrive? And of course, the real question is, what should we all be practicing for the next big change coming our way? It's a great question. And I'm going to steal this from a guest that you have had and I've had, Julia Borstein. And, and her book, Why Women Lead. And she talked the research that she did that showed that many women leaders succeeded when the heat was really on. Why? Because they were not afraid to ask questions. They didn't have that alpha um, syndrome. They were uh, not afraid to ask for help. So in the long term is that leaders who are resilient are uh, have been through things before they have a sense of self-confidence but their self-confidence does not overwhelm uh their uh does not morph into hubris they have a sense of vulnerability and vulnerability or humility that's not weakness that's a sign of strength and when we see that our leader is humble or she is humble and vulnerable that brings us to them they go you know what that's a real person so that's that human element and i think the leaders who express the um, the tenor of the times, but were there for their their uh, people day in and day out, which was another problem for them because so many of them suffered from burnout because they were out, outwardly given, outwardly directed so much of the time. But I think it's this showing a sense of humility, not being afraid to ask questions, practicing resilience, um, and also self-care. <clears throat> John, I'm actually delighted you went there. I've shared this story before, but I'm going to share it again. One of our guests on this program is a woman named Ann Chow. Ann Chow is a member of Franklin Covey's board of directors. She is the former 30-plus year associate of AT&T. She just recently retired as the CEO of AT&T Business, a $40 billion division of AT&T. Ann is a best-selling author. Ann is one of Fortune's most powerful women. Ann is on the board of directors of 3M. And one of the things I like most about Anne is a phrase she repeats over and over again is, I don't know about that, teach me about that. Including with people more junior, like, like noticeably, palpably five levels down, she will say in a meeting, I don't know about that, what should I learn about that? And I think that is both <laughs> Anne's confidence in what she does know, but also her confidence in what she doesn't. And what Anne's really doing is she's setting the tone for what kind of behavior is acceptable, I want you all to be comfortable also saying you don't know about it. Why is that such an outlier skill, perhaps mostly for men? Well, because, Scott, we're wired <laughs> to always be in control. And, and so by saying, I don't know that, that's kind of sets in the panic uh, mode. But what the way you phrased Anne's response is perfect because the, it was like, I don't know. Could you teach me? It was a neutral thing. It was an inviting thing. Whereas um, some of us men might be, well, OK, I don't know about it. Well, tell me about it but if they even say that. But it's it's a being openness, and I think I've worked with many male leaders who are uh, very open and have a sense of humility and not afraid to ask for help. And when they do that to people at a junior level, uh, that empowers that person. Just imagine how you feel when someone who is two, three steps above your pay grade is asking for your insight. That's in it. That's a, a an empowering feeling, and you want to do your best for that individual. So. John, we've heard so much about change, right? Uh, change is constant, change or die. Uh, we're going to be in change our entire life. There's no such thing as change. It's called life now, right? It's called reality. 
We know that change is a highly emotional process for people, and most people in the organization, in my experience, don't accelerate or assimilate to change at the same speed as perhaps the leader may want them to. I'd argue that in many cases, because the leader um, put the change on them, right? People like change when it's their idea, not when it's somebody else's idea. Is there anything you would share with our audience, maybe those who are leaders in particular, about when they are leading in the midst of change, which is now always, and you want them to show grace, what do you want them also to know about their team as they are trying to lead through perhaps could be massive change, maybe it's incremental change, maybe it seems minimal to them, but it's life changing to the associate down the row. Remind us what you want us to know to show uh, grace during change. That's an exact, a very powerful question. And I think the answer is, uh, what we I, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we have a famous football coach, Bo Schembechler, who used to say, the team, the team, the team. That's where the answer is. So what do I mean by that, Scott? Is when the organization, the t- lead, leader is going through a process of change, he or she em- uh, embraces the team. All ideas don't come from the team leader. They come from the team. And they have regular context, uh, r- regular sessions, so they uh, exchange ideas. And it's it's the operative pro, um, operative word is us. We're in, we are in this together. I need all of you. And this is what it works, especially in crises. Um, I've talked to lots of leaders who have been navigating, you know, momentary crises or long term times, bringing the strengths of the people. And it's also an affirmation of the team. Like we don't have all the answers, but you know, among us together, I think we'll find it. And if we don't have all the answers among us, we'll find it because we'll find bright people and others who can help us. So again, it gets back to rely on the strength and the experience of your team. So. John, when we opened, I mentioned you are one of the world's most in-demand leadership coaches, executive level coaches. I want to talk about that for a moment because you have a wealth of knowledge for our listeners because now as a leader, you're a coach. And one of the main roles of a leader is to coach the capabilities to achieve results with and through others on your team. No longer is your job to rush in and save the day or to be the savior. You've got to build capability and capacity. Would you remind us, and take your time on this, What are the hallmarks of leaders who coach? What do they do? What does it sound like? What does it look like? Versus those who think they're coaching, but they're not. They're doing perhaps something else, to quote Liz Wiseman, unintentionally, even accidentally, and then diminishing people. Well, you and I have a great role model in this, and I'm sure you've had him on the show, and that's Gary Ridge, who recently was the CEO emeritus of the WD-40 company. So they went so far as to label managers as coaches, which was the expectation. So what coaching is in an env- in a in a team or a department situation is affirm the value. Oh, first of all, you're specific about it. Let's schedule time to have this conversation about X. You open this is my process. You open up with an affirmative. Get to the root of the matter. What is it? Get the reason for what's the issue. Describe it. And then come to a conclusion, and when will it be? And, and when will we start doing this? By when? And then there's the process of follow up, follow up, follow up. And also the thing about once you establish a coaching relationship with your colleague, with your direct report, you can give that person sort of, excuse me, uh, feedback on the fly. So in other words, if if someone needs help, uh, let's say a, a senior executive is working with a middle manager who has a problem with delegation. So you have that conversation and delegate more. When that senior person sees the manager uh, delegating more, he, he'll pull that person aside and say, good job on that. So in other words, ongoing feedback. It's, as Marshall Goldsmith would say, it's it's a process of feed forward. So it's an active process. So, But it, it's all essentially based on conversation, but it is specific related to development. And I did open with a, a situation or a problem, but it's also, it's also the process of helping that person get to the next level, uh, a, a kind of mentorship, teaching that individual to and, and enabling him or her to take on greater levels of responsibility. As I've spent 30 years now, my literally my entire career in this industry of leadership development, organizational culture, personal development, I, I have a premise. And the premise is that I think I think a leader has 
I think the, the two most important contributions a leader make, makes are recruiting and retaining talent and providing people feedback on their blind spots. Like more than mission, vision, and strategy, and values, and systems, those are all important, they're super important, but as I look at the biggest legacy and contribution, I mean, probably strategy is the most important thing, but right there is recruiting and retaining talent that is noticeably more talent than you are, talented than you are, and being comfortable with that, and giving people feedback on their blind spots. What do you think is the best coaching technique for people to have as like, as like their key default, as a, as a competency? Meaning, I guess what I'm really asking is, if we believe that leaders are coaches and that our contribution is to achieve results with and through others, I'm guessing 90% of your day is doing that. Not hovering over people, but doing some things that make great coaches. You kind of answered it before, but if you assume that someone's key contribution as a leader is to coach others, what should we all be doing? Well, that's a good point. And I think it's a kind of a, a listen and learn. So what are you hearing about this person? What are you seeing mm -hmm. about this person? And what do other people say about that? And I say the, the key fundamentals to some of this is to succeed in an organization. And it gets to what you were talking about. Are is, first of all, you have to be competent in your job. And that's, you know, you can do your job. Credible, other people believe in your competence. And the third thing is you have to have confidence. Confidence in yourself and others have confidence in you. And then there's a magical kind of confidence where the leader inspires uh, confidence in others. We see this in, in March Madness or high school basketball where teams go to the championship level and then eventually uh, you always hear this, coach got us to believe in ourselves. I think that's the, the secret sauce yeah. there. When you're talent and recruiting, you get individuals to believe in themselves. And when there are opportunities for growth or development, you offer it to them. And, you know, so, and, but you have to be straight with them. If so-and-so is not uh, performing up to par, explain the situation. If you need more professional development, do you need to take a course or what? Or maybe you say, you know, this is not the best place for you. So that's the kind of leader who is, what do we call that? Authenticity. You're the real deal. You're leading by example. But you're always listening and you're learning and observing. So. I don't have many regrets in life. None, really. But if I could have a do-over, honestly, if I could have a do-over in my career, I spent 10 years as the chief marketing officer for the Franklin Covey Company. And I think I spent too much time doing and not enough time <laughs> coaching. Like, I don't know that. We talked about being competent in my job. I didn't really need any competence. My job was leading 35 people who all had functional expertise. And I think I was working too much in the system and not enough on the system that if I could rewind a decade, I would have realized that my job really wasn't the chief marketing officer. It was the coach of 35 people who knew expertise well. And I know that's not an epiphany either, but I do think I wished I would have seen my role as coach more. I don't think I was a bad coach, but I think that's something I would um, encourage people to think more about. Is your competency really your expertise in developing relationships, having high courage conversations, discussing the undiscussables, um, modulating your voice and your tone and your rate and your pitch to match someone else's listening style. Find the way that you connect with the other person on their terms, not just your terms. And I think I got about a C minus on that most days. <laughs> um, oh, I'm sure you did better than that, but I think you nailed it, whereas your competency was not um, as you saw, it was not to be the chief marketing officer or the doer. Your chief competency was enabling the, 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 uh, your team to right. succeed as well as it right. could, providing them with the resources as well as the coaching, the counseling, the advice, the challenges that they needed to grow. So that became your, became your uh, competency rather than it. But, but that's a pretty, uh, in some ways, um, I don't disagree with you at all, but I think when we identify with that given role, um, it, it, it frames it in a different way. You know, um, I once worked with a, a gentleman who uh, wrote about him and it's a very successful leader. As a matter of fact, became governor of the state. 
um, talked about the, the hardest job in management is not becoming the CEO, uh, it's be moving that first level management. Suddenly you move from being the doer and the implementer to managing others and you move up. And the more higher up you go, you do less in a way, you enable more. And I think that's what your secret was at, and the why you succeeded in your role. So. Well, from your lips to my resume. Uh, John, you wrote in a recent <laughs> Forbes column that winning can hide many flaws. What does that mean and how have you seen that show up in, in uh, leaders? Well, if you have a, a, a track record of, like a record of success, you can kind of think, well, you know, we have some deficiencies here. We may not have the best team involved. And, you know, we have a bunch of C players, but we're, you know, we're making the numbers. So eh, I'm not going to worry about it. Well, then a crisis happens or a market change or a new competitor or whatever. And this, as you said, it's always change, change, change. And you're not prepared for it. So that's why you have to, you know, I always say that management is the discipline of looking down. And I don't mean that pejoratively, but it's enabling the trains to run on time. It, it is it administrative. Leadership is looking up. It is aspirational. It is also looking toward the future. The reality of today's uh, management is that you need to be a leader as well as a successful manager. So understanding what you can do and what you can't do. And in those areas where you're not excelling, you bring in, you surround yourself with smart people who can do that. So, John, let's end this conversation on what is my favorite uh, chapter in the book. Your book, again, is Grace Under Pressure. Uh, fantastic manual guidebook, I think, for leadership and change and crisis. The chapters are very short, easy, breezy, fast, two or three pages. It's a very swift book, but my favorite chapter you call Leaders Think First. And the reason I've picked that is because one of the most profound pieces of advice I got from our two-decade CEO, Bob Whitman, I mentioned now our chairman, is he said, you know, thinking is a legitimate business activity. Like closing your door, putting your feet up on your desk, putting your hands behind you, and staring out the window for 30 minutes, that may in some cases be the most productive use of your time. And it's counterintuitive because we have this busy as a badge culture where if you were to walk by someone's desk and they were doing nothing, you'd wonder what is wrong with you. Can you kind of reorient us, reground us in this fact that we need to find and create deliberate time to contemplate, to process, to reflect, to post mortem? Send us off with that. Well, I'm going to reframe what you said. You know, you spent your career doing. How about thinking about framing thinking as doing? Because as you described it, gaining perspective, re uh, reading, thinking, pondering, in dialogue with others, reflecting, that is so powerful. And um, every senior leader I talk to, uh, uh, I talk to or work with, I talk about reflecting. Make time for reflection. Set aside that time because you need perspective. You need to gain things. And and just because you set aside, let's say, Tuesday afternoon at, from 3 to 4 or 3 to 6, whatever it is, doesn't mean the great thoughts are going to happen. But if you do it as a practice, then you'll be gaining perspective throughout. It's a kind of a form of, it is a form of mindfulness is what it is. So you become attuned to what's happening around you, what's not happening. It's a wonderful little mantra I learned um, from, came from a military example. It's what's happening, what's not happening, what must I do to influence the action? So what's happening, what's not happening, what do I need to do to help my team succeed. John Baldoni, thank you for pouring into our listeners and viewers today. Your 16th book, third on the topic of grace, is Grace Under Pressure. Fantastic book for leaders to buy for their teams, have a book club, talk about how they're going to build their competencies, their compassion, their grace for every coming change and crisis. John, thanks for joining us today. Scott, it's been my pleasure and a lot of fun. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you again in the future. Everybody, we'll see you back here again next week for a new topic on leadership. <laughs>